really looking forward to her talk about pack pendants. I have a few problems of mine, and I have some questions, and I'm sure some of you might also. So, Tom, could I? Okay. And give us Great. more information about the packs. So, we're going to talk about lady slipper organs today, and so this is a slipper fitting of a lion. So, first, it's appropriate to talk about the slipper fitting. These are uh, quite a few here, and no. Oh. Okay. You, you, you talk out about okay. some of them may not be Yeah, different. there are quite a bit here in the United States. In fact, the state flower of Minnesota is a cypripidium orchid, a little pink little cypripidium orchid. So we're very lucky to have that. This is a Kentucky Kentuckiensis again that is found here in Oklahoma and Kentucky and other places. And then we have our pathopidellums. These are more tropical orchids, not herbaceous uh, perennials. And so the half of the delums are found in, in lots of different parts of Asia, although some of the cypripidiums overlap some of the areas, but they're more high up in the mountains than, than the tropical ones. So then we have, oh, no, I'm not doing this fast enough. And then we have the fragmapediums. These are from South America. And believe it or not, this is considered a new discovery, but it wasn't discovered until 19. 82, which is new when you think about all the pathopidellums that we knew about before then. And so this has changed and excited everyone a whole new line of breeding uh, with Fragmapedium. So it's very, very interesting stories. And then we have the Solanapidium, and these are xeric um, path, paths, they're lady slippers that grow in desert type conditions, very, very thick foliage, like some of your succulents. And so we will uh, look at a few of these and how to grow these. So if we look at the Maxipedium, again, these are even more different, very, very tiny, tiny little delicate flowers, no bigger than the size of your thumb from the first joint up. Very, very tiny. So. Orchids are the largest plant family in the world, and so we have quite a habitat that we can look at. Uh, when a whole state like this is blocked out, it's because they did not participate, you know, they didn't have anyone to participate in the location of these. So cypripediums are temperate zone orchids. That's what a lot of people don't understand. We have 274 orchids in North America. Uh, they're herbaceous perennials. They return from their roots and rhizomes every spring, but they also, of course, if they get pollinated, produce seed, and that seed can go out and start new colonies. They do grow in colonies because they're rhizomatous. So we have about 50 species, and they occur in Europe, Asia, um, 43 in North America, and believe it or not, there are two in Alaska. And illegal to dig or pick orchids on federal land. I'm going to tell you a story. My mother, when I first started getting interested in orchids, kept talking about the lady slipper orchids that grew in Tennessee where she was born and raised. She said they'd go down by the river and there'd be a whole wildflower field and in that field would be lady slipper orchids. And um, towards, um, unfortunately, she passed away of cancer very young and towards the end of her you know, trying to recover. My sister and I took her on a whirlwind tour of all those places she remembered hanging out as a kid. But the <laughs> Tennessee River Authority had dammed up that river and the land where she had those orchids didn't exist anymore. But we stopped at several parks and told the park rangers we were looking for the native Tennessee orchids. And he said, well, you know, I haven't seen any in a long, long time, but I'll radio all the other park rangers and maybe someone had seen some. And so we were about 20 minutes away after talking to him, and he called me on my cell phone. I'd give him my name and cell phone number, and he called me in, and he said, um, oh, oh, Ranger so-and-so knows where someone is. It's near a picnic area. It's real easy to get to, and he gave me the direction, and we drove over there. He said he had seen him that morning. This was after lunch in the afternoon. We drove to that picnic area and looked around and looked around and couldn't find him and couldn't find him, but we found a hole in the ground. We found a hole in the ground. Someone had literally dug up that whole grouping of lady slipper orchids and took it away. And what's sad about that, you know, is number one, did they know what they were doing? 
are they going to be able to grow those wherever they're going to try to grow them? You know, it's very, very sad when you see orchids taken out of nature, or any plant for that matter you know, taken out of nature, and are they going to be successful growing them? So it was really, really sad, and it just shows you that we need to have a conservation program. The American Orchid Society and the Orchid Conservation Society, there's lots of neat, neat things going on. And some people are actually trying to put orchids back in nature, you know, where they've sort of disappeared. And some orchids that have been identified in Hibaria throughout the world don't even exist now, but they existed at one time. There's no gene pool out there to recreate those orchids that have disappeared because of habitat destruction or overcollecting. But let's remember that we do not need to be digging these things up. So uh, all the Cypripedia, they have the general shape where you know you have a uh, dorsal sepal, you have a petal called a labellum or a lip, and then you have your two lateral petals, and then back here you have two sepals that are fused together to be the background. The pollinator actually enters this pouch, and right here is a big hard structure called a staminoid, and the Pollen is on a sort of a pedestal right after those because the insect doesn't come out of the pouch like it entered the pouch because there's a rolling of the tissue there so it can't climb out that way, can't fly out that way. So it has to crawl up and exit right here on either side of that staminoid. And that's how the pollen gets attached to the insect. And if the insect with the pollen on it enters the flower a second time, then the stigma of the pistil is underneath that staminoid, and as they climb out again, they deposit the, the pollen there. The stigma is receptive. And so our Cypripedium parfifolium, large, large flowers, you know, predominantly in upland and forward bloom in, in June and July. So these are not going to be in the forest. They're going to be at the edge of the forest where you see a lot of other wildflowers. And most of the time, the forest is too shady um, for a lot of our plants. Uh, this is Cypripedium regina, called the showy lady slipper. It's a state flower of Minnesota. And so I, I was up in Canada one time, where it grows up in Canada too. And at a gift shop of one of the botanic gardens there, I found uh, they had some china teacups and saucers made with the, the Cypripedium on it, so I got a couple of those. I, I feel really lucky I got that. They grow in calcareous, wet soil. They don't really grow in the soil, I shouldn't say that. They grow in the leaf litter that is on top of the calcareous soil. We put um, lime in our media where we mix our media for our lady slipper orchids, because most of them like that. And so it blooms in the early summer to mid summer. And there is an alba form of it. It's very, very rare, but you can find that high quality of wood. So, so you can see the high habitat is very, very, very large. And oh, I'm sorry, this is the habitat, the green part. Where it's orange right here in spots where it used to occur, you can see some areas right here. Um, that means it's disappeared. They haven't found it since the last counting of the plants. So you can see, look at that, if you're walking through the field one day and, and seeing that, all those beautiful, beautiful flowers like that, really, really, really pretty. Uh, Cypripedium acola, uh, the pink lady cypher, very, very large again. The pink pouch is just a showstopper when you see this. Grows in wooded and coastal areas up all the way to the Arctic Circle in the pine woods and hardwood forest. And so if you look at the map here, you can see again, it goes all the way up and into Canada. This is the United States map, so they don't show the habitat in Canada, but there's lots in Canada. And again, you can see it has disappeared in, in, in many areas. This is what it's going to look like. It's going to be in the part shade of the wooded area. <coughs> and uh, very, very short again. Cypripedium kentuckiensis, you can see right here, it's on the east side of Texas, uh, Louisiana, Arkansas, and parts of Oklahoma, Georgia, Alabama, and into Tennessee and Kentucky. And so 
when it's when a when a plant is named by the botanist who first uh, discovers it, they're called a uh, the botanist who describes it has to collect 12 specimens and put them in 10 different herbariums in order to have the specimen pressed and dried so other people can identify it. And then the Congress of Botany Nomenclature meets every three years. And so he has to write it up in a scientific journal and then he has to get permission to name it. And so a lot of times the species name is very descriptive like most of them so far have been. But in this case, he found it in Kentucky and he wanted you know, that in the name. So you'll see either description name of color, size, shape, or uh, the place where it grows. There is a big, big push in the United States through the orchid conservation group to plant these and grow these from seed, grow these from divisions in order to reintroduce them back into protected land. And protected land is considered protected if it's land you know, that is not going to be developed. You know, so this is going to be a park, this is going to be conservancy land, this is going to be USDA land, you know, some sort of land. In Fort Worth, we have the Fort Worth Nature Center, and we have, due to development, dug up spiranthes and relocated them there because we knew they grow there already. Uh, they also have Coralizia there, Hexalexis there. And so it's really, really nice when you have a cooperative place like that where you know the land will never be so often developed. And that's what we need to do is find those locations and reintroduce some of our, our species into there. Now, Papapodellums um, are different, you know, they're, uh, I'm sorry, Papapodellums are uh, tropical orchids and they do, again, grow in leaf litter, many of them on limestone rock outcroppings where the leaf litter is accumulated there. Some of them grow very, very near water, where water is constantly running from a waterfall, um, from a creek, or from a river, and so you'll see those. These are very, very easy for us to grow in our greenhouses and on our windowsills and under lights. Not every single one of them by any means, but this is something, if you have not tried half of the you need to try it. Number one, they're low light requiring most of them. You know, we could say medium light with others. But these grow right side by side. Well, not side by side, but, you know, in my same greenhouse that's shaded for the, for the Phalaenopsis. And so that's what low light. They grow awesome under lights. Also, you can bloom them under lights if you don't have a greenhouse at a windowsill, usually a south window, maybe not directly up against the light glass, maybe a little bit away from there, but low light, so that's really, really nice. The flowers can last one to three months, and this is also wonderful, that uh, they last so long, 60 to 90 degrees at a windowsill, that's pretty easy to get. Um, requires two weeks cold treatment on a windowsill, that's easy to get. <clears throat> in our greenhouse, we'll lower the temperature, we lower it for the phalaenopsis for a couple of weeks, and so we'll lower it for the pathophodellums also. <clears throat> now, some will have green foliage and some will have a mottled foliage, you know, with a little bit of color in it, whitish, almost variegated, you'd say. And I want you to understand that green foliage ones like it a little bit cooler. You know, we grow those in the coolest part of the greenhouse by our wet wall where our fans up front draw hot air, moisten it down, cool it. And you're at that end of the greenhouse, sometimes it's 10 to 20 degrees cooler at that end of the greenhouse than it is at the fan side of the greenhouse. So it's really, really nice. The model foliage likes it a little bit warmer. Colors vary from white to dark, dark magenta. You know, the breeding line, you know, starting with a species like Spicerianum, many, many species out there. And believe it or not, these hold the species form and some of the coloration, particularly uh, the sepals and the petals, up to three and sometimes even four generations. So sometimes you can literally look at a hybrid. And say, oh well, wow, Spicerianum's in the background. 
you know, are super hooly eyes in the background. It's really, really neat to be able to see that. Uh, the habitat, uh, mainly Asia, you know, starting way up here, um, going all the way down to Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, um, Laos, you know, through China, um, Burma, or Myanmar. And so, you know, the habitat is very, very long. But also, you have to remember that lots of that habitat is mountains and valleys and mountains and valleys. And so different ladies of her orchids are going to grow up in mountains than grow down in, in the valleys because of the temperature uh, limitation. They grow in the shade or part shade either of a mountain, of, of, of trees or other big plants, um, little leaf litter, uh, moist areas. Uh, they like a lot of moisture. If you've ever repotted one, how many of you have grown these before? You know, please look at the roots very, very carefully. They actually have root hairs more like some of the terrestrial plants that we grow. And if, boy, if you see those white root hairs coming off of the main, uh, main large roots, you know, you are doing really, really good because they really, really like, like to have those root there with lime, limestone, um, subsoil. And so the foliage, here's the model foliage that I was telling you about. Here's the solid green foliage. And then here's another modeling effect that you get. And so know that some of these like a little bit more light than the other, a little bit cooler than the others. Lights, medium to low light, shade in other words, uh, they grow really, really well really well and bloom really well under light. We want a south or southwest window. Um, grows and flowers easily under lights, fluorescent, um, HID, LED lights. And so it's fun to, fun to be able to have these. So here's a light stand with HID lights and here's a growing uh, in a room with LED lights. So can you see what I'm telling you about LED lights? There's just no color in the plant. And so sometimes when people go into a growing room like that, it's really good to turn off those LED lights, turn on white light so they can see them. Yes? I have a question because I heard years ago that the solid green ones needed less light than those, the, the model green ones. I was going to ask the same question. But I have that opposite on here? Yes. Pardon me? I have that opposite on here. Yeah, you, you, you have the model with lower, lower light. Okay. Yeah. I'll correct that. Well, well I, 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 just didn't know, I didn't know whether. Yeah. I, I didn't hear that. I yeah. didn't look. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the model should be a little more light than yeah. all green. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But if the modeling, I can tell you how you can tell you have too much light. Because the modeling starts washing out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. And so you can give these things too much light. Model, you do need more light. A little bit more light. Yeah. Not much. Not yeah. much. Yeah. Because I've lived by a six or seven model in my east window of my bedroom. Yeah. They do grow well. They, they get full sun to about 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but my, and I've also heard the plants. And do they bloom regularly? Well, they're you? too young to bloom. Oh, okay. But, but the other thing I've always heard is that the green ones, and we've all heard this, the plain green ones, and you're right, show uh, cooler temperatures. Just like you said, mm -hmm. and the bottle warmer. Mm -hmm. And yet, on the other hand, there's, there's so many different opinions. Oh, so there's so many opinions. And then I heard someone else say, uh, It doesn't matter. It, I wrote them the same yeah. line. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. it seems like I one have, may, they may go better yeah. if they have the right line. But some people wrote them the same line. Yeah. Yeah, I have a bench on my east wall. You know, and, and, and the majority of my pathophagellums are there, but then on the second bench over, I have a lot too. And so the ones on the east side against the wall obviously are going to get more light than the bench over. Yeah. I'm not sure I see a difference. But you did use different shades. Uh, I have yeah. Paradox's of shade on the green ones. Paradox's shade. I have. Well, you give your plain green ones up. Uh, you try to give them a cooling tree, a cooler as well yes. as you can. Almost certainly. That's what they look like the same. Yeah. All the packs and all the phalaenopsis get the same cooling tree. Well, right. Yeah, because they're all on the same tree. But during the summer, like yeah. the growing period, yeah. uh, do, you, do yeah. you try to give the plain green ones a cooler temperature? No, there's no way to do that. Not in my room. 
course. Not mine either. Okay. And then um, um, this is another type of LED light, and it's also going to be growing hydroponically. I find that the orchids, um, some people are very, very successful growing this, but, but I have not been. This is at our um, laboratory at our research and extension center there in Dallas. Um, temperature range from um, 55 to 90 degrees. I mean, that's what my greenhouse does, so that's what it is. Now, you go, you go four feet above that bench where the wet ball cool breeze is not blowing on it, then it's 100 degrees. You go, you know, two or three more feet, it's 110 degrees because heat rises. And so it can vary, very, very greatly. But the difference between day and night temperature is also very important. So you just want to try to get that differential. Um, cooler varieties can take temperatures down to 40 degrees. I've even had some people out in the out and about say they even see, you know, a little bit of snow, a little bit of ice on them every now and then, but that's rare and far between. Uh, lower humidity um, during cool temperatures um, because if we have our humidity too high when we get our temperatures down low, it, it, it causes some bacteria and fungus problems. So we've got to uh, meet that temperature need without getting it too humid in there, unfortunately. So as far as cooling goes, it's a combination of cooling and fans blowing and shade. And so uh, we use um, evaporative coolers, um, very, very, very nice, put them right under the benches so they blow up through the bottom of the benches. Um, we use a wet wall system in our larger greenhouse where the water is constantly dripping through there. And that's very efficient on hot, dry days because our big, giant fans at the front of the greenhouse draw the hot, dry air in, cool it, and then drag it all the way across the greenhouse. I have it fixed so the, the pad, the fans, no, pads, the armature can go at different rates in order to get more air through there. Uh, since this picture was taken, I've also put up an insect netting at this end of the greenhouse because unfortunately my land stops right about here and the land um, outside my fence is owned by a church down the way and they never mow it real efficiently and so unfortunately when they finally do mow it, every insect on that two acres wants to blow through my wet wall. And so I've got some insect netting there to help control that. Shade compound, it's a type of paint. You can get it in green or white. And you know, you can put that on real thick to make good shade or real thin. It's easy, very easy to wash off as you want more light. And then there's shade cloth. Shade cloth comes in 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50, 60, 70, 80%. And then you can order it with grommets on it and attach it to your greenhouse so it doesn't blow away very easily. And then on the inside then, there's a lot of people that will put their shade cloth with automatic open and closers on bigger commercial greenhouses. Boy, that's nice too. And a lot of those are going to silver cloth instead of black cloth. And even some of the shade cloths that are being put on the outside there's a real good research project out of the University of Florida for, where they have the main foliage industry in the United States. There's a lot in California too. But they did a, a study on is black shade cloth better than white shade cloth, is green better than, and they have red and orange and blue and all these different colors in there. And it made not a huge significant difference. It made a difference, but not a huge significant Research is all about a significant difference. And so um, everyone went back to using um, black and, and, and white and silver shade cloth after that research was printed. Um, heating, you know, um, we use uh, natural gas. Um, some people use these little propane heaters. And then, of course, some people use boilers in order to create hot water for their greenhouses. So very, very important that you know what your source is and that you have a back, a backup. And so on our very, very large commercial greenhouse, we have an automatic generator. Everything's automated that if something goes out, 
that generator goes on, it's run on natural gas. At home, we have a natural gas generator too, but it's like, hey, daddy, wake up, go turn the generator on, you know? And I do, I do. Uh, not lately, though. Humidity, again, is so, so important to growing orchids. Well, you don't want it too high, you don't want it too low. Low humidity stresses out the plant and therefore makes it more susceptible to insects and diseases. And particularly, particularly spider mites. Spider mites like it hot and dry. And when it's hot and dry, me and those spider mites will breed and go through a life cycle in about three days. And they grow so fast and do that so fast, they get very, very resistant to a lot of the miticides that we use. There's a couple of new miticides out. How many, has anybody tried Sultan yet? It's a brand new miticide out. It's just approved in California. Anybody take Greenhouse Management Magazine? Um, the, it was introduced in this last issue, a August issue. And so um, I use um, kitty litter, butler's pans, um, all kinds of different things, put gravel in it or put egg crating in it when I'm either growing it or displaying it and I can hide that or um, I gravel in my floor, of course. And then your potting mix. You know, how many of you have decided on what potting mix that you like? I can tell you all kinds of stories. I told you the story about the housekeeper of the science um, <coughs> building, you know, at Tarleton State University. Here's another one. So I went to this private estate. This lady called me and she said, something was wrong. All our orchids are dying. And, and I drove over there and all the orchids had false spider mites. Not two spotted spider mites like you get on your tomatoes. But false spider mites. False spider mites bore into the tissue. And so they're doing damage by boring into the tissue. And a lot of people think they have a fungus. And so they treat it with a fungicide. This lady's greenhouse manager had been treating those phalaenopsis for three years with a fungicide. And they were just dying. And I'm saying, these are false spider mites. They're very hard to get under control. I think we need to do something real drastic here. And the lady looked at me and she said, is there hope for, for many of these? And I, I'm going, do you want to see them bloom anytime soon? She was 82. And she said, I want them to all bloom. What do you mean? I said, okay, we're going to get rid of all of these. And this was before Hurricane Andrew and Jones and Scully was still in business. And I called down there to Jones and Scully. I gave them a list of all the orchids we threw out, and they shipped up a lot, a lot of orchids to this lady, and they were blooming that spring prayer. But we cleaned out that greenhouse of not just the orchids, but all the other plants, because false spider mites can drop down into your potting medium. You know, they can hide on other plants. And so we cleaned out that greenhouse and pretty much sterilized that greenhouse. And so it was ready to go. But she wanted them all pot, potted in something because now she didn't like her greenhouse manager anymore. You know, well, I don't want her the greenhouse manager good job. I'm a consultant, you know. And so she said, well, what do you suggest? And I said, well, what about the extruded clay product? You know, a lot of hydroponic growers are using this. Why don't we pot in that? And she said, okay, let's try that. Five years later, she called me back. You know, and she said, I lost my greenhouse management and my driver, butler guy, is, is watering. He waters everything every day and kills a lot of stuff because of that. And she had switched from Phalaenopsis to Cattleyas and built a whole other greenhouse where we could get, get lots more light. And I said, well, why did you pot them in bark? Why didn't you use the extruded clay product? And so we repotted them all throughout what would not make it. And I want you to know she was like, 87 by now or something. And um, we potted all those cat layers and that, that guy watered every day and didn't kill a thing. And so you've got to know how you're going to manage the orchids and choose the potting material um, according to that. And so you see these big um, compost tumblers here. Believe it or not, I didn't buy either one of those. Master gardeners gave them to me because they didn't like them because they made such small amount of compost, you know, and every gardener needs lots and lots of compost, you know. And so this is my phalaenopsis and, and cat everything in there is mixed 
But the little, the shorter one, not the little one, but the shorter one is just used for the pass. Just used for the pass because I'm going to put some dolomite lime in there or maybe some oyster shells, some hoof and horn, you know, that type of thing. And so because of the lime in there, um, I don't use that to mix any other potting material in. So you got lots and lots of choices. I like, uh, you know, one part bark, one part charcoal, one part perlite, and that's a good mix. And depending on the size of the bark, the size of the perlite, the size of the charcoal, you know, you can get big chunks of it, or you can get itty bitty or medium, whatever you're potting in it. Pretty, pretty good. Um, I use some big sponge rock charcoal in the number, th I mean, perlite in the big three or four um, charcoal. Um, and then a fourth a cup dolomite lime for 10 gallons. That's what will fit in that mixer. And so that's what I use for that. Uh, repot every 12 to 24 months. Notice I'm saying 12 to 24 months because a lot of your pathophidellums like to stay wet for a longer period of time. If you're gonna use bark, it's going to break down a little bit faster because of that moisture that you put in there. And because of that, you're going to repot them every year to, tw uh, to 20, every year or every other year. So watch that potting meeting. Watch that potting meeting. And the other thing is, I see people, you know, uh, my Rothschildianus, what is the foliage spread about like this, you know, on the Rothschildianus. And, and so do I need to put it in a pot this size because the leaf spread is like this? No. They like the roots really, really root bound. And so if I can go up to, to a pack of Padillum and hold it by its foliage and the pots stay on and the roots are so thick in there, that's what they like. They don't like to, to have a lot, a lot of room in there where there's going to be a lot of opportunity for other things to grow. And so this is my mix right here, one part bark, one part perlite, one part charcoal. Again. I have seedling grade charcoal and perlite and, and, and bark, and I have medium, and then I have the large. I buy the, I get the really, really, I get a pallet of a time of the perlite and the charcoal. I get the big, big, big bags of charcoal. So they last a long, long time because of that. Okay, so pack of bedellums. You know, when you're first growing orchids, you know, you're so excited to get anything you can. Well, when I first started growing orchids, you know, I moved from Germany to, to go to college here in Texas because they had a grandfather-in-law. And my grandparents lived in San Antonio so I could get in-state tuition. When you're applying for college from Germany, they think you're a foreign student and want you to pay and they'll break you some out. So I got to use their address. That's how I got here. Got here as fast as I could, right? And so when I first, you know, got interested in orchids, when I was living in Washington, D.C., saw the orchid greenhouse there, or several of them, and then I went to live in Germany, went through high school in Germany, went to Heidelberg and Frankfurt and saw those botanic gardens there, wanted to grow orchids. So got here, and so I wanted orchids. I bought my first orchid, believe it or not, at a garage sale. And garage sale. That was before they separated the garage sale ads on the newspaper. We were looking for furniture. But then all of a sudden, here was a orchid sale. And I'm going, what do they mean, an orchid sale? You know, and my husband said, you know, I'd love to look at